All right. Happy Friday, everybody, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy it's, a, it's a dreary 10th of January outside. I uh, had an 8 a.m. meeting today, and they were, uh, they were supposed to fly out, and they're not flying out today. So, <laughs> oh, well. Um, so we're doing something a little different uh, today. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, we've got a, we've got a nice uh, moderate-sized crowd in-house. Uh, we're using some new tech uh, to us. It's called OBS. Uh, it's pretty cool. Open Broadcasting System is what that stands for. But what it's going to allow us to do at events like this and, and other events that uh, we either participate in or are hosting is it allows us to capture the event uh, on a high quality camera, uh, capture input streams like computer streams, capture secondary cameras. We've got a webcam here, so we have a picture of the room, uh, multiple microphones, etc. We can then con uh, switch between all of those import sources live uh, and broadcast out live uh, to YouTube, to Facebook, to Instagram, uh, all simultaneously. But we're recording this at 1080p, high quality video, high quality audio, so that after the fact, we have a real high quality capture that we can then potentially edit if need be, uh, but put up for posterity uh, as, as a long-term uh, source. Uh, and re-slice and dice into new content uh, that may make sense to, to put elsewhere. So this is kind of our trial run uh, for this technology. We've got an, an actual cameraman in house today. Uh, say hi, Chris. Hi. <laughs> Chris is uh, Chris goes back to school next Friday, so uh, timing uh, slotted in well with us and. Uh, and Fred, our stage manager, is running the show in back. So that's, uh, that's what's different today. So welcome. Claris Engage 2020. So uh, I actually had to edit this slide moments before we started here because I put January, 2019. Still in that part of the year where my brain hasn't switched. Definitely don't have that 2020 vision thing going on myself. Um, but yeah, Claris, Claris Engage is the new word for something that most of us have been involved with either briefly or in, in some of our cases decades. It used to be called DevCon or FileMaker DevCon. If you weren't part of the FileMaker world, there's actually lots of DevCons. The one we think about was the, the FileMaker DevCon. So it's no longer called DevCon. It no longer has the, the word FileMaker in it, right? Because Claris is is a new thing they've 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 rebranded but they're still somewhat the old thing right their message hasn't evolved a lot this is their new message we make powerful technologies available to everyone and that's kind of always been filemaker's mantra <laughs> claris is grabbing that and extending it They've got that workplace innovation platform. That is, they just rolled out a brand new website, claris.com, and that's center, front and center. Uh, they are beating that drum loudly. That's front and center of how they're thinking about themselves and how they're talking about themselves is platform, platform as a service. But it's a bigger ecosystem than it used to be. It's not just FileMaker anymore. So they've got two engages that they're planning. They've got one in Nashville, Tennessee at the, at the uh, Gaylord Opryland. Uh, I know at least one of my staff members is super excited about this because he hails from Nashville. Uh, and, and for this one, the call for speakers is open right now. Uh, ends by the end of the month. Uh, conference registration will be in March. Uh, there is a sponsorship program as well. We as a company need to decide, are we interested in sponsoring this year? Are we interested in having a booth this year? So those will be conversations that we're having. Somewhat newly though, uh, Claris is promoting what I would call an equivalent uh, engage, again used to be DevCon, uh, over in Europe. And historically they've had non-US conference events and they've been 
uh, well attended, uh, but they've been much more what you might think of as a regional event. This year, my sense is, and everything that they're kind of messaging and talking about is, they've got two world events. This is their kind of their new model, or at least the 2020 model. There's two world events. There's one in the US, and there's one in Portugal. This one, of course, is a couple months later. So uh, to anyone on my team, if you're just angling for that European vacation, get yourself on the docket here. <laughs> And uh, that may be a way to go there, right? So the call for speakers here is also a couple months behind. Uh, conference registration is a couple months behind. So this is a slide that I captured uh, two, three months ago on an uh, internal uh, business call with, with Claris, uh, where they were basically uh, anticipating the call for speakers and they articulated as clearly as possible what it was they wanted to hear, right? So at the top, the very first word I think is the thing we've got to pay a ton of attention to, stories. They want to hear stories, right? They don't want to hear tech babble. They want to hear stories about digital transformation. So that's first and foremost. They do want technical best practices, but look at the two products, right? It's their two newest things. They rolled out FileMaker Cloud this past fall, and they're trying to put a lot of energy and momentum into that. There are aspects of that product that speak to the vision of where they're trying to go. I think those of us on the back end who like to take this stuff apart and noodle with it at a technical level, see it still as a partial interim step. I think there's, there's interesting conversation that can be had around that. But Claris FileMaker Cloud is the new thing on the FileMaker platform. And then Claris Connect is the new, new thing. Now, Claris Connect uh, gets released sometime this quarter. The messaging appears to be probably February. And we are doing, our next public brain trust is going to be Welcome to Claris Connect. Right? We're going to show it, we're going to play with it, uh, we're going to interact with it uh, as a group, see what we think about it and what we like about it and so forth. So uh, they want to hear technical best practice sessions primarily about those two products. Now, I don't read that as saying they're not interested in a technical best practice discussion about something else to do with FileMaker or something else to do with Connect, right? But this is their guidance meaning that it's probably a, a bigger lift to come up with a topic that's not somehow related to these things, right? And then at the bottom on the business front, how do we advise customers on digital transformation? And how do we advance our businesses in this space, right? So that's their statement of what they're looking for, Claris' statement of what they're looking for. Today's brain trust is about, okay, what do we do about that? And, and to get us rolling here, uh, our newest team member, uh, Javi, uh, currently has the title of intern, but most of the people who have the joy of working with him think that that title is maybe somewhat misplaced, uh, is going to talk to us about Claris, FileMaker, and the cloud. Give us kind of a little mini presentation here. So at this point, I'll hand him the mic and we'll hear from Javi. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. So, to introduce myself, my name is Javi. I'm a proud student of 42 Silicon Valley and an even prouder new addition to the Harmonic team. And today I'm going to be talking to you about using microservices and serverless concepts to build resilient, scalable hybrid solution. Well, what I like to call hybrid solutions. So let's dive right in. Many people wonder, what are microservices? Why should we use them, right? Let's take a look. If you'll take a look at the diagram here, this is taken from the Microsoft Corporation. It is a diagram of the microservices architecture. Very, very plain, low level. So in this, our, uh, in this architecture, we have our client all the way off to the right side there, uh, the left side, I'm sorry. Um, and then we have an API gateway. 
Along with that, we have a whole plethora of services here in the middle and some uh, management and orchestration layer on the bottom there. What this means for your application is that your clients will hit one API gateway, which can also be scalable by nature, to hit many different services. Perhaps you want to send out an email. Perhaps you want to pull data from a, a database or write data to a database. None of that has to be boxed into one single box. All of it can be separated out and scale as needed. So let's take a look a little bit deeper. Why should you use microservices? So the primary purpose of using microservices is to modularize your application. No longer does everything live on one box. Everything is separated, meaning that the security concern and the network configuration is also separated. If your one box is getting hacked, your business gets do uh, goes down. However, if you have microservices, if you have an issue with one of your microservices, the rest of them live independently. So you don't have to worry about your entire system failing. It could be as simple as rebooting that microservice or launching a new instance of it, right? Rather than having to worry about downtime of your server and reinstantiation of that server. It also streamlines your development. Everybody doesn't have to work on one box and make sure that everything works completely, totally together. Um, there are many instances in today's world where one service goes down on a single box, rendering the entire box useless. That means all of the other services being hosted from that box are no longer available, right? And that can be a big problem. These microservices also allow you to uh, work with different frameworks, and they're completely language agnostic. That means that if you're a Python developer, you can have a Python service. Maybe you're doing big data, right? Python is well known. Python and R are well known for big data management, right? So you don't have to worry about, hey, will this work with my existing JavaScript code or Apple scripts, right? Yes, it will, because it's a standalone service by itself and can connect to anybody else's standalone services. Another thing is you can quickly develop them on demand, right? Because you don't have to worry about breaking your pre-existing infrastructure for any new pieces that you may need in the future. You can just build out that feature itself on its own microservice and connect it into your ecosystem. They're very loosely coupled, right? Um, and overall, what does this mean? It means it enables us for continuous integration and continuous development, right? We don't have to worry about, hey, we built this feature, customer doesn't like it, we need to take down the box and reinstantiate another one, right? Customer cha customers have changes along with their businesses. Their business needs change over time. This is just the reality of it, right? So what we can do is speak to our customers and tweak those individual microservices as needed. And we can have the pre-existing version already online and available at any time. And the newer service we make tweaks to and slowly integrate it in. We don't have to worry about load balancing or anything like that because a lot of the existing platforms such as Google Cloud Platform, AWS, or Azure already support in-house load balancing and distribution. So now what, are ser what, what is serverless? What does that mean for serverless, right? Well, the name's in the title, right? Serverless, not one single server, but many different servers, right? So at the top here, we have our clients again. Very nice, they're on the cloud. Um, we have our file storage right here, a reporting tool, databases, and authentication. Through various APIs for our various products, let's say for QuickBooks or MailChimp or whatever it is, we can create custom cloud functions to handle services that they render for us. Right? Um, and these services, again, what's, why should we break them out rather than having them on one box? Well, when you have one box, you're paying for that box's uptime. Right? So it's essentially useless. You're paying a bunch of electricity. There's a lot of network throughput that you have to worry about. What if it's a service you only use once a month, once a year, once every two years, right? You don't want to have to be paying for the continuous upkeep of that service, right? You can save a lot of money by moving to a serverless architecture. In the serverless architecture, you have a base image, which is uploaded to a cloud registry of some sort. From there, it's available on demand and on standby, and it scales down to zero if you'd like, right? So let's say it's a service that somebody wants to reach out of the blue one day, right? It'll deploy in milliseconds and be available and respond to you in seconds. Moving on, why should we go serverless? If you take a look at this diagram here, which was kindly, uh, kindly uh, <laughs> exposed to the internet by Deloitte, we can track kind of the evolution of containerization and software, uh, and software as a service, right? On the left hand most side, we have physical machines. Now physical machines require a lot of configuration, a lot of worry. You have to worry about firewalls, network, security, a lot of other um, 
a lot of other things. Scalability is one of the main things that you have to worry about there. Um, if you want to scale on a physical machine, that means bringing in another physical machine, hooking it up to the network, and having a load balance to distribute that, that load evenly. So that can be costly, right? Those machines don't come cheap. Moving on, a couple years later, we had the innovation of virtual machines. Virtual machines allowed us to have many different machines running off of one central, central powerful uh, box. So you can, have, you can just spin up another virtual machine within the same machine. But what does that mean? It means that within that machine, you still have to worry about networking and scalability. It's not automatic, right? You have to, someone has to take a look at the load and boot up another virtual machine. Enter containerization. With containerization platforms such as Kubernetes for orchestration and Docker for containerization, we're able to take a base OS and have that on our system and spin up different containers as needed. We can even set limitations to, hey, we're receiving this many transactions. We want to spin up this many boxes. We want to have a minimum of this many boxes and a maximum. But what doesn't that allow us to do? Well, to put it simply, those boxes are still running at all times, right? And we have to go in and manually uh, tweak them or take them down or boot up new boxes a lot of times uh, on our own. And there can be some issues. So with serverless, what we have is we have the ability to have that a base image for each one of your, let's say, microservices or services. This is a standby image that's ready and available on demand on the platform of your choice, and it deploys in milliseconds. So if it, again, if it's something you use once a year, once every two years, and you're randomly hitting that API, it's going to be ready for you, and you can, you can count and rely on it. Um, some of the benefits there are there's little to no server management. You don't have to worry about that. All, a lot of it's abstracted away and taken care, taken care of by the cloud provider of your choice. Um, now, there are some, uh, some instances where you're going to want to add some specific rules for your clients right, and some specific functionality, which you can do. You can definitely go into the, your cloud platform console and make those tweaks to add the ex uh, maybe security parameters or whatever it is that you need to do. It's simplified scaling. On your platform's dashboard, you're going to specify, hey, I want a minimum of this many base images available at any time. And I want a maximum of this many images, because I'm not going to pay more than that. Right? We have increased productivity. Your DevOps people don't have to worry about setting up network infrastructure and security management for those uh, servers. Again, a lot of it's already abstracted away and taken care of for you. Um, what this means for our clients is that we have a pay-as-you-go model. You're not paying for those boxes, and neither are, by extension, neither are your clients paying for those boxes and their upkeep at all times. You're only paying for them when you need that service, that specific service. Now, this doesn't mean that every single service will always be scaled down to zero. There are certain things, such as that API gateway that we mentioned earlier, that will be up and running at all time to direct traffic to your many different microservices. Now that we've got all that out of the way, how in the heck does this relate to FileMaker and Claris? Right? What does this bring to the table? for our current solutions. Let's take a look. In the center here, we have our FileMaker solution. Right? We know it's great for, as a UI. We know it's amazing as a database. As far as indexing goes, we can pull and push data in an instant. But what if we want to connect to outside services? QuickBooks, Salesforce, some other databases we may have for our clients, MailChimp, a lot of uh, important services that we use on the day to day. Normally, what you would have to do is you would have to set up an ESS table with your databases, which can be proven to be slow. Instead, we can launch microservices using, their, using that provider's specific API, which many providers today already have APIs in place. Building out this microservice, you can set it up to link your FileMaker solution to those outside sources. And you can, uh, you can have them boot up only on demand. So let's take a look. For example, the Google Maps here. Maybe we want to do address validation right, for a form or a credit card payment. That's not something we're going to be doing all the time. right? Maybe we're not an online retailer. Maybe we just take uh, payments for services once in a while. right? So we don't need to validate addresses all the time. So what's the point of keeping that service running? We can build a microservice there, make it serverless so it scales as needed. And this one individual piece is responsible for talking to Google, doing the address validation, and returning to us the values that we're expecting or need. Um, another example is maybe you have another FileMaker solution, right? Maybe you have another service. Maybe it's yours, maybe it's not, that you want to speak to. You can actually build 
micro functions to speak to other micro functions, which then in turn can perform actions for you or they can reach out to uh, other external sources or perhaps to your other FileMaker solutions. Now all of this is great and it's amazing and it does save you a lot of time versus having to develop on one box. But there's a better solution. And thanks to Claris, we now have Claris Connect, well, or will have within the quarter. With Claris Connect, we have a plethora of already pre-built integrations where you can contact uh, any one of these services here and perform an action. It's as simple as sitting, setting up a flow, right? And what a flow is, it's basically saying that, hey, I want to start with this application here. And when it does an action, I want it to trigger the next, uh, uh, the next action here. Perhaps that's an action from a different service. And you can chain these actions together to ultimately complete your task. And that's using outside services or some of your own. It automates the, uh, your workflow with these pre-built pre services. Moving on, Claris at launch plans to have at least 25 or more connectors. You can connect with other microservices that you've already built yourself with custom webhooks, as well as all of the ones that they provide. It inter you can integrate it in minutes, and you can interact in seconds after. You can make templates for flows that are common, things that, you'll plan that, pl things that you're planning to do often that you'll be making use of a lot. Perhaps it's a flow for triggering a Slack message uh, upon a new event registration on Eventbrite, right? That's something that can be used for many of your different clients, right? Not just for one single client. You can save that flow as a template and reuse it over and over and over again. Now, when should we go with these, uh, these already pre-built connectors from uh, Claris versus the great microservices I've been talking about? Well, on the Claris platform, the connectors come with some default actions that are pre-built into them. For example, for Gmail at the time, you're able to create a new label, delete a new label uh, upon you know, receiving an email or sending an email. But what if you want to do something more than that? right? What if you want to send out a mass email? right? Or you want to scan your inbox for any other matching emails with that label. right? That's some custom functionality that's not already pre-built into Claris Connect. So what you can do is you can instantiate a microservice also based off of Gmail. You can integrate that with Claris Connect. So when you receive an email, you create a label, and then you'll hit your microservice to go ahead and say, hey, this is the label name. Let's pull all of the emails that match this label name. And we can have that data within seconds. All right. Um, with Claris Connect, you're not bound down to these cloud applications or collections, uh, connections that exist. You can also use your on-prem apps, right? So whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, we're always talking, we're easily communicating, and easily scaling up or down. I'd like to take a few minutes to take some questions, if anybody has any questions. All right, so first of all, Hav, awesome. Thank you. Good yeah. job. You're welcome. So I'm just going to jump the queue here. OK. So back up a few slides, and I, I want to I pick at, yeah, there we go. So now go forward, forward one more, build it out. Okay, right here. So the first thing that strikes me about this, so, so I kind of get the modularize the application and the separation of concerns part. This is really interesting, right? The, the, the networking and security config, because I feel like we're constantly chasing uh, a rabbit that always finds a way to get further ahead of us, right? So the notion that I can make it AWS's problem or Google's problem or Microsoft's problem that that particular OS that they're running behind it is properly patched and properly secured and so forth, okay, there's a lot of attractive stuff there, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think I, I think I kind of get this stuff. Dig into this a little bit for me, the, the streamlined development. Because I think that requires maybe some new or some different thinking. Um, wh what do you mean by that? Say, say what you're saying in different words on that bullet point. OK. Um, so currently, when we think about applications, a lot, of, uh, a lot of older systems think of applications as one central application. In this microserver. Like FileMaker. 
Like FileMaker, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, with microservices, we're separating the concern for all of your integrations, whether they're a database or whether they're another service that you want to use. Now, on a typical system, you have to have a team of developers working together to make sure that, hey, when developer A builds out his new feature or service, that it won't mess up developers B, C, D, and E's work, right? Right. So when you have microservices... We, we call that the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and this kind of breaks the law in that sense. <laughs> um, so in this model, you, you're not having to sit down with a team uh, at, for every concern. Um, it's modularized. These microservices can communicate to each other via a JSON or XML whatever you prefer. And so you don't have to worry about, hey, if this goes down, what about these two? Well, if this goes down, this is down, and it's independent, right? This isn't working. But the rest of our application will still function as expected. And so the code is never going to clash with another piece of code on another microservice. Right, OK. So I, I, I kind of get, get my head, head around that. The, the language framework agnostic, I think what you mean there is something like, um, we could have a microservice written in language A. We could have another microservice written in language B. Language A's microservice might interact with an, another API mm -hmm. that is RESTful. B might interact with the SOAP API. And then C might be something that's RPA or something else, right? So, so the, the point of this is it seems twofold. It's what are we interacting with on the other side? Because not everything is kind of fully modernized and RESTful, right? E even right. other systems. Well, this we have a RESTful API for this, but we only have a SOAP API for this. And well, we have a, a batch download function you can trigger this way over here for this other part, right? Mm -hmm. So and and but but the thing I hadn't thought of previously was that you know you're. Your language of choice, hey, I want to do it in Node, versus someone else wants to do it in Python, et cetera, right? Right. So that's kind of the other piece there. Right. And then, so there's also the, um, there's also the, uh, the utility of each language, right? So languages like R and Python, like I mentioned before, are really good for data analysis and moving around uh, big data, right, and analyzing big data, whereas JavaScript is better for asynchronous tasks, right? So we don't lose those two things. For two different uh, uh, for two different services, in fact, if we have a big data service, we can say, "Hey, we want to build it in Python. It'll be better, faster, more efficient, and we can have an asynchronous task running on a Node server because that's what it specializes in." Right. Okay. So jump to the next slide. And the next slide. Okay. There we go. So so I I was watching this and I was envisioning in my head as you talked about it, the various states of FileMaker, right, itself, mm -hmm. where some of our customers, many of our customers, are, are still over here in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, right, where FileMaker itself has its own physical machine, you know, sitting on a network somewhere. Um, and, and in many cases, that's like the expected simple deployment model. Some of our customers, our first customer that introduced us to virtualization uh, was Fast Signs back in the, I don't know, late 90s or very early 2000s, right? And, and we were like, what is virtualization? You know, I mean, we didn't have a clue. And, and it was VMware, and, you know, and we fought with it, and it didn't work a lot with FileMaker. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a whole thing. But anymore, I think the notion of running FileMaker in a virtualized environment is pretty well understood. It's, it's common in the industry, especially in large organizations that have uh, Windows, IT, you know, VMware. Uh, I, there's still some challenges around it that I think uh, non-FileMaker aware IT staff don't always uh, understand, right? So that's always a struggle for us on the, on the consultancy side to make sure that the resources are there and some of the ways we like to do backups and so forth uh, are there. So, so that's kind of like FileMaker to date, right? We're here. Mm -hmm. But my understanding of where FileMaker wants to go with the next versions of FileMaker server is here, right? My understanding is they want to eliminate 
a different code base for Windows versus Mac versus Linux. They want a container that is FileMaker Server, and that container runs in a container management environment, and then they can spin up the same container in the cloud as we could spin up in an on-prem server. Right. So, I, you said, what was it, Kubernetes? Mm -hmm. That's like a crazy term. Is, is, that, a, <laughs> is that a brand? Is that, what is That's Kubernetes? A, so, Kubernetes is, is uh, Google's solution for orchestration management. Okay. So, we have Docker, and we can have a Docker machine, right? And it, it'll have master nodes and slave nodes, right? But what if we want to have multiple masters, right? What if we want to spread out the network and make it bigger? Mm -hmm. Kubernetes allows for that interaction and orchestration of how your how your containers will come up, how they will come down, how how the masters and the uh, the slave nodes will be managed. Yeah. Okay. So I so I'm envisioning in my mind, and I know nothing, just for especially for the uh, you know for the posterity here <laughs> on on the internet of this video, I know nothing specific about what FileMaker slash Claris is actually planning with FileMaker Server, but based on the things that they have publicly disclosed. I'm envisioning something along these lines, uh, right? A, kind of a containerized model. Can we imagine, though, a scenario where, and not even the microservices part, right, but the kind of the core, what we think of as FileMaker, where FileMaker starts to head up in this direction as well, right? Can we imagine that? And what would that look like? Like, how would that work, right? And And maybe, the way I'm asking the question is, is there, is there a parallel? You know, if we look at something that's entirely platform as a service based from day one, like Salesforce, and their, uh, you know, custom framework development environments, or some of the stuff that AWS does and so forth, is there something that kind of is like what FileMaker does, but that's already trying to do it entirely serverless? Do we know? Does anybody have thoughts about that? Well, not FileMaker, but Claris is seems to try to go in that direction with uh, Connect, right? Yeah, I mean that's absolutely their stated goal with that product. Well, but Connect is connecting to other services out there. I mean, when you talk containerization, I mean you could take FileMaker and containerize it. We have the database section. We have a separate container that is the authentication section and security section one that is the uh, user interface development and they're you know separate from each other and you can have multiple ones of those you know that would talk to one database you know uh, service that just does that and so but the question is do you, is that beneficial to break that out and there, there are times when, you know, because like microservices, I like dealing with microservices and that usually the benefit of microservices to me is the ones I've dealt with is it does something very simple, really fast that I usually have tried to do in FileMaker went really slow, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but looking at the whole framework and trying to break it out, I, you know, there's, anyway, I, I just, Right, like, like how, how would it work, right? It, it, certainly, getting my head wrapped around a FileMaker system or a FileMaker database, a file, if you will, that is hosted somewhere, I could see maybe this microservice does this thing with it and that microservice does that thing with it, but it seems like there has to be a thing, the actual file itself and, and its core services set that has to always be running, has to always be available for those microservices to make an inbound call or well, edit a record or whatever. Real simple, where it's just the database, then everything off of it is like, for example, schedule scripts, uh, backups, all these would be separate, in essence, services that would then call this, and they would actually, or we would think of them as applications or services, but they would be separate from it. Whereas now, in essence, that's happening, but it's all put into one framework, and one of the benefits of breaking that out versus keeping it all together. Right. You know. Right. Interesting, interesting thought exercise. Um, so, so I, this, this caught my um, attention as I was, as I was thinking about that and wondering if this is kind of the thing that where FileMaker wants to go, because I, my instinct is you can't go here with core FileMaker, with FileMaker, the product, 
doesn't work here, but it probably works here, right? It probably works to push it to this type of a structure and level. Um, jump one more forward, two more forwards, build this slide. All right, so, so the kind of the rhetorical question to the room that I have. So we do lots of, with, with different systems, we do lots of work where I'm talking to QuickBooks with a plugin. Or I'm talking to Salesforce via an API, um, I think it's still SOAP API that we use with uh, one of our clients that we talk to Salesforce, right? Uh, when we speak to um, SQL, if I were to add a my in front of that, you know, MySQL generally for us, um, we're usually speaking to MySQL from FileMaker through ESS, right? Which means there's an ODBC driver on the FileMaker server that allows the FileMaker server to maintain a shadow table, a FileMaker table, that FileMaker is internally linked up to the keys on the SQL table and lets us do inserts and updates and deletes uh, across that connection. But it's really cool because, hey, I just magically can see and touch the data that's in that SQL database. It's really uncool when I've got millions of records and all of a sudden um, the cool thing that I built and can do, I've scaled out of because it was so cool that everybody wants to use it and now, you know, <laughs> my system's breaking, right? So, so I, you know, we've done all of this stuff in various ways in the past. To me, the rhetorical question is, at what point do we stop using a plugin, right? What, what's, the, what's the time to do that? When do we pitch that change to a customer? Um, at what point do we stop using an ESS connection, or do, we, or do we not write a set of just bespoke, like PHP code? to talk to a MySQL database and build a microservice for it. And, you know, one obvious answer is if we're building something brand new, you make the evaluation, okay, old way, new way, right? That's an obvious answer. But is there, if it's not brand new, you know, what, what do we think are kind of the leading indicators that we should look at doing one of these things a new way, right? Any thoughts? Um, I would say that it really comes down to customization. With your APIs, you're not bound by the plugin tools or capabilities that are you know, already pre-existing there. Um, a lot of plugins dictate, this is what you can do, right? But what about the things that you want to do? Sometimes they're not on that list. When you build your own custom API, you're able to interact with the other outside service to your liking. You can even, um, you can even like, automate the flows within, right? Perhaps it's something specific to you. Let's say you want to grab something from SQL and then write it to Salesforce, right? You can actually automate that to a point where it doesn't have to come back to FileMaker. You send one outbound request from FileMaker, it hits your SQL database, and your, your API will then contact Salesforce directly or maybe to another uh, microservice that will speak to Salesforce. So it's really the, autom uh, the automation and the customization that makes microservices um, a little bit uh, better in some senses than the plugins. Okay, so I th think your answer there was not necessarily doing a new thing, but doing an old thing better, faster, fewer steps, maybe less interaction. So there might be a scaling benefit, uh, or there might be a speed benefit, you know, like, like, like Taylor was saying, where, mm -hmm. oh, well, we're doing it and we're getting it done, but it's, you know, it's two seconds and I can do it in a quarter of a second this way or, you know, whatever it is. Correct, yeah. Um, all right, so, okay, okay. so jump, uh, jump forward. I have a quick question. Yeah, I, please. I know, actually, it was on the slide just before this one here. Uh, no, that, the I got one it. just after this came up, it's, it looked like the answer to my question was there. Ah, oh, darn it. <laughs> this is, okay. give it a second, it, it likes to do it. So. so my question was going to be, and I, I thought I knew the answer based on last year's, when it was still DEF CON, DEF CON, uh, but I see FileMaker as one of those connects. So theoretically, one of these microservices could actually be 
to another file maker system. Is that not correct? Yes. So perhaps we could offload certain functionality in a more independent box where, for example, uh, your permissions don't have to match the permissions in the system, you know, the bigger system with, you know, lots of complicated permissions. You could send out a call to this microservice that's running something in FileMaker, and that could be using APIs to do, you know, from other places, but that, that could be independent of all the security Correct. concerns yeah. that you have set up at your client level, right? Is that a possibility? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, I think that the way Claris invent, uh, envisions Connect is it's not just centric to FileMaker, but FileMaker is just one of the connectors, right? So it's just another piece. The overall structure of Connect is connecting your applications to each other, and that could be a FileMaker application, it could be an in-house application that's based off of a different framework, or it could be one of these existing, um, existing uh, uh, connectors that they've already built. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So, I mean, everyone is familiar with data separation model. This effectively is application separation model. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and hence I think the term orchestration beyond integration um, that, that, they're, that they're bringing up and, and trying to use more frequently. Um, I, uh, Heather was asking me uh, yesterday when we were talking about, uh, okay, how do we move a thing from here to there? And the question was, well, is there a way, so in the calc, is there a way for me to call an API from a FileMaker calculation? You know, and my, and my answer was, well, today, without the use of a plugin, you know, if we've got the use of a plugin, we could use a, a smart pill or a monkey bread to do a curl call from inside of a calculation, we could do it that way. But we can't really, you know, FileMaker just straight up native FileMaker, the default way to handle an external call is insert from URL, mm -hmm. right? Which is a script step, it's not a calculation call. But if I'm understanding the roadmap correctly, I believe that FileMaker has messaged that one of their near-term deliveries that they're working on is the ability to integrate from the Calc Engine, not just from an insert from URL. Yeah. Well, because that was one of the nice things that you had in certain plugins was the ability to do it in the calculation. Yeah. And uh, so you can do it, but you're limited through a plugin. It would be great if uh, it'd be native, like the insert from URL script step. Yeah, to totally agree. And I and, and my, my understanding of the roadmap, I don't have it right in front of me, and I didn't review it right before this meeting. But my understanding is that the fact that they're rolling Connect out uh, has incited their desire to make that work for us as well. Because I, you know, I think they get the same the, the same thing. So that would that would help facilitate kind of the client side, uh, the client instigation side of that from FileMaker. All right, next slide, next slide, after your question slide, next slide. Okay, so I wanted to, to bring up these two questions. And the first one, let me elaborate on this just a second. So how do we get the chance to speak about Connect? So when, when we look at those that slide I had at the beginning where it said technical best practices FileMaker Cloud Claris Connect all right no one has practiced with Claris Connect so we've got until the end of the month to propose a presentation how do we get a chance to talk about it right how do we how do we pick a topic that adds to the overall discussion on this great new tool um, and, you know, and, and does something that they're already not going to pick someone else to do, right? So I think we can imagine that Claris themselves are going to give one or two or five or ten sessions on Connect. Right? They're going to have Giuliano and Sangita up there and they're going to show this or they're going to give a preview of the next version or whatever. They're, you know, so there are certain things that first party Claris is going to do uh, mm -hmm. themselves. Right? Then there's kind of another class of um, sessions that are going to be given by the various uh, gold-plated uh, name badges in the community, 
right? Because they always pick this guy to talk about this kind of thing. And they always pick that guy to talk about that kind of thing. And occasionally they pick that woman to talk about that kind of thing, right? But it's mm -hmm. usually for these like big headliner sessions, it's always, almost always like five guys, right? Who are every year they're doing that session. So I don't want to propose the first kind of session or the second kind of session. We're wasting our time, right? So how do we get a chance to talk about it? Because I do, I do want to be in the conversation, right? So how do we do that? And then I think this maybe is a session that I would propose, this second question here. But I think it's the same question that we've been kind of batting around in a few different ways in the conversation to date. And, and something I'm going to want to come back to next month when we're, when we're playing with it. Uh, as, a, as a group and looking at it and so forth, when do we use Connect, right? When do we go to our existing customers and say, I want to introduce you to a new thing that, by the way, I also want you to start paying licensing for and, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, when do we use it versus when do we roll our own microservices? Or as in the example you gave, Hav, do both, right? Roll our own microservice, but still use Connect, right, for some, for some compelling reason. Mm -hmm. Or when do we just do it old style, right? Because I've already got FileMaker. I've already got an Apache engine that's running PHP and this and that and the other. So does it make sense with that customer or that stack to use a microservice or to use Connect instead of just, you know, let's just add yet another PHP page, right? So I think I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the room's thoughts on on these two questions and they're you know to an extent i think they're connected but it, you know from those two angles yeah what do you think taylor well one of the things i'm thinking about is obviously we got connect and there are a whole lot of questions on what it is and when it'll work and obviously the marketing looks good we're just going to connect this to that and that'll be great uh, the reality is all those connections we can do now with curl and an insert from url without getting connect so the question will be is when is it just you know cheaper for us or to keep doing that and we, we have you know QuickBooks online and you know I've done a bunch of them there are a lot of them out there that are already doing that versus what is connect going to come and it's going to how much is it going to cost for it to be you know reasonable to use but but the real plus for things like that is if you've ever had to maintain a uh, an API that you're connecting to I mean Google's famous for this hey this is a great one uh, well that was version one we now have version two and all way it broke everything in version one and you know it is uh, Claris you know connect committed to keeping these connections going that's where the real value comes in not only connecting to these services but keeping up with the updates and the APIs on the other end of things that's where and I'm interested in it would save my clients a lot of money development time of my having to re-update APIs and things. Otherwise, if, if it's not, it's just, it's just as easy for me just to do it myself for my customers with what we have already. Right. Um, That's a very good concern. Yeah, good point. So, so I think to try and reword the same thing you just said, in my words, to make sure I'm hearing you right. So for an existing customer, an existing implementation, um, it's conceivable that it makes sense to jump to Connect if what they're saying by providing Connect at some price that ostensibly makes sense is this is today, but this is also we're going to keep it working, right? When you build a flow that does this thing to that thing, when they change the, the part on that side that you used to call it this way, now you call it that way, we're just going to make it work. We're going to fix it. We're going to do the translation. It's, we're going to cut over to V2 before V1 goes away, and it's going to be magic. You don't have to worry about it. That's worth a lot. Yep, that is definitely a value proposition that I think most people can get behind. Uh, you know, kind of the proverbial, I really don't want to manage the spam engine for my email engine myself, right? I mean, it's one of those kind of problems to solve that doing it individually just makes no sense for anyone. So, so then I think the other part that, that I want to pick out a little bit is the I could do it just as easily. I, I don't know that yet, right? So, so like if we're doing something brand new that we haven't done before, 
I think, at least from Clara's perspective, I think they're saying the value proposition is you can get it done a lot faster or a lot easier by using Connect than you could by doing it yourself. Um, now, if you've already done it yourself, right, you've already got the code stack, I already know how to do it, it's just click, 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 plug it in, I think that probably isn't true, right? But if it's, if it's something you haven't integrated with before, I'm interested to see, is it, is it that easy, right? I mean, it looks really easy in the, in the, in the designs, but is it that easy? Because I think maybe that's the other value proposition is I can, I'm going to bill 30 less hours, which covers maybe the first two, three years of licensing, right, on, on that connector or something like that. That, yeah, makes sense? So, what I'm hearing in my mind, okay, a, a session on, uh, for lack of a better term, the roadmap to moving existing solutions to connect and the value for and how to do it. Or basically, not to get wordy here, I'm saying, okay, that sounds all good, like, like you've already said. Uh, why would I want to do that? And what is connect going to offer or, or is offering and will build on to make that uh, the best choice to move forward with. Yeah, so, so and, and I think that kind of fits in that, really in that technical best practices and the business category, right? It, because it's, it's the how do we do a technical thing or when do we make a technical decision, but it's also how do we, how do we look out for our customer's best interest? You know? And right, our, our mutual best if, interest. If it is that good, then that's a marketing point to make to to uh, increase. Your, I mean, for business purposes. I mean, it's all wrapped up in a nice little ball. The way they're they're putting it out there. But how do you peel that onion? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good thoughts. So. I think that's, that's, that's a good series of questions. One that popped into my head while I was listening to what you guys were talking about that I think maybe is another area where that kind of gets to the answer to my first question by being part of the second question is how do we, what is the right way to build your own microservices and integrate them with Connect, right? So for whatever reason, we've already made the decision with this customer that they're, they're going to license Connect. We've hooked up Connect to this thing and that thing, but now there's a thing that they don't have yet, right? That, that uh, Claris has not rolled out an API to this service yet. Maybe it's in process. Maybe it's too small for them to ever consider. So. I think there's, there's definitely room, there's definitely space for what kind of microservice, uh, how to do it, what kinds of things to do it, when to do it, you know, that kind of, that kind of question area as well. Um, so I've had the pleasure of uh, playing with Connect a little bit um, through a beta program. Um, without giving away too much on that front, what I do want to say is I played around with uh, using custom webhooks. So there is an already pre-existing way for you to integrate your own solutions. And it's also almost as simple as using their in-house connectors. Um, the gist of it is you're provided a URL to, uh, to make inbound and outbound calls to, to, to uh, interact with your existing API. So what I'll tell you from my personal opinion of playing with it, it's pretty easy and it's very, it, it kind of follows that same flow that they have with Connect, so. And the other question too that I gotta, you know, do is look at this forward this, you know, obviously Connect you now is gonna cost something. We already have Node-RED that already does it, is already out there, is already open source and already free. Claris needs to make sure that what they do is better, easier, whatever, than what we already have that's out that's free that does the same thing, supposedly. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And I think a lot of it comes back to what you were saying earlier with APIs developing on their own independently. What if they break, right, with a new API rollout? And uh, one of the, the core things that I think uh, Clires will be focusing on will be to make sure that those APIs are kept up to date, those connectors are kept up to date with the API. So your business logic is never interfered with. So a question that comes to my mind based on the do we roll our own microserv microservices, right? So let's say we roll our own microservice for our own use, but maybe it's really good. Doesn't that mean that there might be a market for that microservice and making it available? So I think that's a question that we as a company need to take into account as well. Um, maybe this is an area that we could grow some more. We certainly have a lot of talented staff <laughs> that could, could work in that area. But I also want to comment on the first question, how do we get the chance to speak about Connect? And I think that part of the answer to that is in the storytelling. We've got to tell a compelling story in order to speak, whether yeah. it's about Connect or anything else. Does I think this year the stories matter. Does it start with, once upon a time, there was this guy named Hav? <laughs> <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I think a lot of that, a lot of the story-based things will, um, will come out when, once Claris Connect becomes a little bit more uh, um, available. Um, actually, not even a little bit more available. Once it becomes available to the masses, then I can go ahead and show you guys some actual uh, uh, flows and how we would use them, where they'd be more beneficial versus our own microservices. Um, but again, being that it's not available on a public scale, I kind of refrain from keeping some of that information in the presentation. Yeah. Right, and I think I think part of the stories are going to develop after uh, our deadline for submission. Right? So to an extent, we have to in, imagine forward the story that we're going to tell. Mm -hmm. And uh, there may be a lot of fill in the blank and magic happens here as, as presented, but I think we can still figure out a credible way to say, um, here's the story we want to tell. Right. Well, that gives you, the author, free hand to write the story. Yeah, which, which really is how this stuff happens, right? Nobody makes a presentation to give in August in January. It right. just doesn't work that way. Yeah, well, so I was thinking, you know, to address the, the second question, obviously if you've already got, you know, in your existing solution, you've already got your integrations built out with other things, I think it's, unless there's some extremely compelling reason, there's no reason to redo all that work and connect just so that it's the newest, coolest thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're, you know, working with a new client that needs to connect with, you know, there was a client I was working with a few years ago who, in their system, we did Google Calendar, MailChimp, and Xero, which is a, a, a QuickBooks competitor. Well, all three of those used a different um, authentication method. So Google used OAuth 2, Xero used OAuth 1, which is a massive pain. Um, and requires some very creative FileMaker workarounds. Um, and then MailChimp used um, basic, uh, uh, like basic authentication token. Um, and so if you've got a client who needs to connect with Google and QuickBooks or Xero and MailChimp and something else and something else, well, then this list of things starts becoming long and all of those authentication processes are going to be slightly different. And if, you know, for, for us at the time, there was one thing, I guess two things that we needed to do with the Google Calendar integration, right? Create events and edit events, and then I guess delete them. Right? But if you, you need to start doing lots more creative things with that one API, well, like, the, then the, the, the time aspect uh, becomes an issue. You're like, well, I, it'd be a lot easier to just create this with some, a tool like Connect then have to build out every single one of those things. So I think it kind of depends on how many external things the client needs to connect to, right? If the only thing they need is, you know, there's, we want to, you know, query Google Calendar for a list of holidays, it, I don't think it'd be worth setting up a whole connect flow to do that. Just write your own insert from URL with a get and you're good to go. But yeah. 
I yeah. could see, for example, it would require us making the commitment to do it, and perhaps the client's approval for us to do it. But I think a real good story that could potentially involve Connect would be the LT Pro. I could yeah. see us building a microservice for things like manual checks where we prevent the types of errors that we encounter now when they're, because they're doing it manually, we give them another way. We could use a microservice to do that. We build that microservice so that when payroll processing is happening, the, uh, you know, we're pulling reports and uploading data to them and, and that's happening very old style now. And I think that while we could maybe just use an API for UltiPro, if we do a microservice, maybe that's one thing we can call instead of three or four different things that we're calling to do those tasks. And I think that would be uh, very beneficial for the client and is a really good story. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Thank you, Hav. Yeah, thank you. Turn this on while I stick it on. Um, the next thing I wanted to discuss is is really the the bigger topic here at large, and um, you know I'm I'm interested in this topic at a community level. I'm interested in this topic at a personal corporate level. Um, I would say that uh, you know, with my company specifically, I spoke at FileMaker DevCon many times uh, back in the old days, olden days, in the early 2000s. Um, I got burned out personally for two or three reasons and stopped. And it was really hard to get back on that train for whatever reason, whether it was because I wasn't in FileMaker's eye as someone who had something compelling to say, or maybe I had too much gray hair. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure for, for whatever reason, right? It was really hard to get back on that train, and we, we spent a lot of effort uh, as a company to try to get back in the speaker list. Um, so a couple years ago, we we did a big push and we presented, I think, 18 proposals. And we got three, right? They, they picked us uh, for three different sessions, three different speakers. Um, they, they corroborated my gray hair uh, bias uh, by not picking anyone with gray hair. Um, <laughs> although one guy's older than me, but he, you know, he doesn't have gray hair. So. <laughs> uh, so, and then, you know, last year we did a similar thing, uh, only uh, you know, we did a lot, of, a lot of proposals. We spent a little less time on the production value of those proposals, uh, but they, they picked three again. And, and interestingly, uh, three very different topics. And I think they're going to do the same thing this year. I think they're looking for... And they went with the gray hair. And they did go with the gray hair last year, <laughs> yes. Um, I think they're looking for, uh, you know, a constant evolution of what they're talking about. They, uh, they have made the strategic decision, they, Claris, have made the strate strategic decision to make these sessions publicly available. It used to be that if you didn't attend DevCon, you didn't get access to any of the material, right? You had to have attended to get the binder that had all the speaker notes. And then they started recording them. You had to have attended to get access to the recording. And anymore, man, these, these things are on YouTube, right? Now, they're not all instantly on YouTube. You're still a few months behind by the time they get them post-produced and rolled out. But they're, they're putting them out there publicly. And I personally believe that's part of why they don't want the same session the next year, right? They've, they feel like that session's been done. That topic has been given. We've published it. It's available on the internet. We don't need to say the same thing again, right? We need to say a new thing. So, you know, who should present? And, and maybe let's chat about that question both conceptually, like should people with gray hair present, or should 
brand new wet behind the ears folks like Hav present or both and why, right? So who should present? What should they present? And, and you know, again, at a conceptual level, there's kind of the what's new, but what's important, maybe what hasn't been adequately sorted out in the past, that they're really missing the opportunity by not having a presentation on this topic, right? What, what should be presented? And then how do we put together a winning proposal, right? Again, it's a highly rhetorical question, but I think it gets back to those issues of if you want to present, um, they're looking for a magic combination of things that I personally don't know what the list is, right? I, I think it's, it's the topic, it's the credibility, it's the opportunity, uh, you know, it's, it's a variety of, of, of things. So, uh, you know, in our remaining minutes, I would, I would welcome thoughts from the, uh, you know, thoughts from the room here and uh, say what you think. And, and, and let me start with the, the non-harmonic folks in the room. Are you guys interested in presenting? Have, have you thought about presenting? Have you proposed and been frustrated at the, you know, lack of reception? Yeah. What's, uh, Dan, Taylor? Well, I mean, I, I, I hear from Rosemary always saying put all the uh, presentations in. I've put them in for years and never been accepted either. So, to, you know, to, you know to, yeah, I, I put it in, but, you know, you just, you know, it goes through its process. And I, they, they do have their favorites that they, they work with that usually yep. are people that are more, the people who you see uh, get it are usually more that have some business interaction with Fomic or corporate, and that's only natural. Yep. But, uh, you know, they they obviously get way more presentations than they can take, and I guess that's, you know, the benefit of putting things in. But um, I, I know we, the PUG group, uh, a couple of years ago, did a big push to see how many presentations we could uh, put in. I think we did like 25 or something like that suggestions among the different groups but none of us got accepted so um, obviously there's you know a high turndown rate but I think that's also because they're able to be real selective and you know the idea is to get excellent presentations so uh, I, I'm still encouraging everybody that I know to put pres you know presentation suggestions in it doesn't mean you, that, you know it's not like you have to prepare the presentation up front you just have to it's right now it's just ideas <laughs> so yeah I would add as, as encouragement, Taylor, to remind you that I spoke in 2002 and then thought for sure, because I did two sessions in 2002, and they were both very well received, and I thought for sure I would be a speaker in 2003. And I spent 16 years being disappointed <laughs> All right, after that, right? But the session that they picked of mine last year was actually a session that I had proposed the year before. And I had a couple of sessions I had I was proposing, and at the last minute before uploading them, I looked over the ones I had done the previous year, and I decided to throw in two of those again. And they picked one of the ones that I'd actually written up the year before. So I think that while I got to the point where I, I'd read that email that says, yeah, we get too many, you know, we get so many, and I think, yeah, that's what, yeah, that's not the real reason, right? Uh, maybe it is. Maybe it is the real reason. <laughs> so I just would suggest that anyone who's interested continue trying. Well, and for sure, there's a, there's a topic list that they're interested in for whatever business reason, whatever marketing reason, whatever, you know, what's going on in the world. Right. There's a topic list that they're that they're interested in that may or may not be in alignment. Right. You know, and I think the changes each year. So yeah, it does change. Uh, you know, your topic last year, which was on, uh, you know, compliance uh, uh, and, and not HIPAA specifically, but that would be an example, GDPR mm -hmm. being an example and so forth. That's kind of an old topic that's become new again. Right. With, with GDPR and with, with other similar things going on in California and whatnot. Right. That, that FileMaker, I think, felt like, okay, we've got, we've got a new reason to bring back up an old topic. I think right? also the point that you raised about this past year was the first time that they've made all of the sessions publicly available to the entire public. 
right? And so that gave them an opportunity to maybe reintroduce, to re, you know, bring up some things that maybe had been discussed years ago to some extent. Um, and keeping that in mind going forward, I think it's important. I hadn't thought about that until you mentioned it, but I think that's a real good point to not be proposing things that have really already been discussed. It's got to be a new twist, new story. So I, I think two things that, that Harmonic could do present really well is one, how to develop in a team. You know, they're, they're, uh, I think a lot of FileMaker developers start out um, where it's just just them and you know file maker development is fairly easy when it's just one person right because everything's in your head and you know what's going on but when you step into a scenario where you've got two three four five six developers all working on the same system um, working on different parts of the system how do you effectively manage uh, that that development process um, and then you know develop the uh, uh, manage the migration process from okay everybody has done their bit in in this file or in this set of files and they how do we you know get that over to the client's production system I think another topic that harmonic could could speak to is um, user acceptance testing and after you've got your stuff built and you think it all works right how do you actually get the client engaged in that process and get them to look at it and test it and go, yes, this works as expected. Um, because they, they may find things that you didn't, which I know, I know has happened to us in some of our larger rollouts, is we've done as much testing and digging as we can. And inevitably, the client, and they're poking around in, you know, in the, the dev system, they find things that we didn't catch. Or, or they go, this is great, but this one thing. Or, this is great, we absolutely love it, like, can we get it yesterday? <laughs> um, and so it, it, that process of not just, hey, we finished, uh, tonight we're going to put it on your production server, I hope you like it, right? Yeah. I, I, and the next morning is the first time that they see it, and they go, oh, well, this isn't what we thought it was. Or the first time that they see it is you presenting it to them in some conference room somewhere going, you know, here's your final product and here's your invoice, you know, thank you, bye, right? To actually get them engaged in using um, what you built for them before it goes live. Yeah, I think I, I, I really like that particular angle. I think it's, you know, it's, it's definitely more on the business side, mm -hmm. less on the technical side. But I've, I've been thinking a lot lately on UAT and some of the things that go around it, and of course it's different with a small customer. UAT may be a very concise thing. With a big customer, a big system, it can be a very elaborate thing. But just conceptualizing it out and treating user acceptance testing and documentation and handoff as how do you succeed, right? So we, we write custom software and we spend all this time doing it, we do clever things, and we learn things, and we're really proud of it, and we're excited, and there's that, that somewhat trepidatious moment where we hand it off to the customer, finally, you know, we pry it out of our engineer's hands and get them to let go, and we hand it to the customer, and then, you know, this user's having a bad day, or they're change averse, or whatever, and they click the button, it doesn't do the thing they expected it to do, and it's garbage, and they never use it again. And then the, the, the frustrating part is maybe we spent four months doing that and the customer paid for it, cost, cost a lot of money. And really what failed there? What failed wasn't necessarily the technology. What failed was the set of expectations that the user had going into it or what failed was our, our ability to set the stage and to make the handoff of the baton work, work well. So, that's a that's a that's definitely an interesting topic that I think you know we have some experience and some stories that we could speak to speak to that topic on. I have a question. How frequently do non filemaker developers speak at DEF CON? Because we've got several people here who have to work with all your filemaker solutions but don't actually 
use FileMaker. They use Python and other things, half the stuff Javi was talking about. You would think they'd have a very interesting perspective and reveal a lot of the pitfalls and potential areas of growth for FileMaker, stuff that needs to plug in, or even people who understand a lot about development and software building who don't necessarily do it themselves. They could be a client end. You could probably find them, though. I don't have someone to name. I would think they'd be an excellent speaker, but I don't feel like I hear a lot about them. Lynette, it is as though you're reading my mind, almost <laughs> like you're related to me. Funny story. <laughs> so, yeah, I, and I think that... Laugh, it makes me cough. <laughs> I think that gets to who should present, who should present. We've, my perception is that there has been an increase in, in recent years of FileMaker choosing end customers, and they specifically asked for customer stories where the customer's actually a part of telling the story. So I think, you know, if we can get any of our customers to agree to be a part of telling their story, that would be a definite check in the column of likelihood that we might get picked, right? <laughs> So, so there's, there's certainly end customers, whether it's someone who's an in-house developer for a, a company you might recognize or a really compelling business case, or someone who is you know, the end user or, or the decision maker or whatever. There's been a little bit, a little bit of cross-technology, what I would call uh, outside-in technology folks presenting, but just a smidgen. Not a lot. Generally, it's someone who is really good or has made their business around some other thing, but also started with FileMaker or learned about FileMaker or uses FileMaker as well. And so they're the PHP guy that talks, for instance, right? And, and, and they have tremendous credibility talking about PHP because they're really good at it and so on and so forth. But um, they're also, they're, they're, a, they're still a FileMaker person, right? So I think this year with Connect coming into play, there's more call than ever for someone to get up who's not first, second, and third a FileMaker person and talk about the Claris platform, the Claris environment, um, in, in, a, in a different sense from a, like you said, what, what are some of the pitfalls, right? What are some of the challenges of using FileMaker as a data source or doing a certain kind of thing with FileMaker? And how do you, how do you work around those? What are some of the things that, you know, if, I, if I'm primarily, hey, I've always used MySQL on the back end and then I ran into this customer and they made me use FileMaker and I was like, holy cow, this part of this works so well, it's so cool. Like, what is that thing, right? What would, what would someone from that perspective talk about there because that that kind of insight is extremely valuable to those of us who make our living uh, with a tool and you know sometimes it's hard to get that outside view we have some folks like that in this organization um, gen generally seated in the back row <laughs> at, at these events <laughs> so, so if you to use that example if you've got a a Python developer, and I, I know what it is, but I never played with it. But I mean, I, I'm just, as a marketing guy, thinking of, of topics, you know. So this guru could say how FileMaker enhanced in, in, uh, my Python so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and made it better or facilitated it better. Uh, it's, I'm just throwing out a, a a way of thinking about uh, coming up with a, a story and a, a topic that that is focused on FileMaker, but isn't FileMaker. Yeah, why I love using yeah, FileMaker and like Python. That. Yeah, what FileMaker and fill in the blank. Right. So so other languages with FileMaker and certainly. Connect gives us a wide world of this with that type opportunities. Um, I think an interesting trend that's going on with where Claris wants to push FileMaker and so forth is also 
they, they've decided, I think, wisely that they can't be all things to all people. And they, there's even certain races that, I, I don't know whether this part's wise yet or not, but the races they've decided to stop trying to run. Uh, for instance, the we're going to set, we're going to build a separate executable for Mac OS and Windows OS and, and Linux, right? So, so the, the first kind of evidence of that culture shift that really hit me in the face was the admin console for FileMaker 17, where we were, we were looking at FileMaker Server 16 and we had these stats and we had these graphs and we had these things that we'd gotten used to because it had been kind of an iterative evolution over the course of many generations. And we learned how to, you know, good or bad, we learned how to run our stuff using those features. And then they took all of them and they threw them away and they gave us a third of them back in the 17 admin console. And they gave us some new stuff and different ways to do it and API and this and that and the other. But they basically said, there's a whole subsection of this we're just literally never going to do again, right? And it specifically is around the performance monitoring when they basically pointed in the direction of Zabbix. Um, they said, yeah, go, go look at what Zabbix is about. Now I think in one sense that's Claris being realistic with what is the size of their engineering team and what are the things they're trying to accomplish and hey, sorry, we didn't get to it, so who has a good idea? And somebody raised their hand and said, well, there's this thing called Zabbix. And they're like, great, Zabbix, we're going to put it in the keynote. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was an element of that going on, right? But I think that at, at some level, they've also started to really strategically make these decisions. Okay, they've gotten in bed with AWS and they're not going to change that decision, at least for a while, right? That's a, that's a long range set of implications. So to me, that starts to say, um, you know, there's, there's this angle. Another angle would be what I might call, I don't know, supporting or complementary technologies of which Zabbix is an obvious example, right? Um, and, and, and so that's one that we should certainly put on the list here. But I think, there's, I think there's lots of them that's not necessarily connect specific, but that's in that same kind of sphere of what, what choices has Claris made that someone could, who's maybe not traditionally a file maker guy or gal, um, but what choices have they made that, that we could talk about that's in the space that kind of is in the Venn diagram of where they're headed with FileMaker and, 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 and Claris Connect, I think is another interesting, interesting question. Um, any, just off the top of any of y'all's heads, any thoughts on, on that aside from, you know, Zabbix, AWS is really too big. I mean, it needs to be AWS what, right? There's an AWS, there's a thousand things under past that. I don't think FileMaker is going to get rid of the developer, but in, in um, the, the Claris Connect, if you look at kind of where they're going, they're removing the need for a developer. Yeah. Um, they're making it more drag and drop friendly, and it might be a 10 year plan, but um, Claris Connect in particular is going to give functionality to someone who has no clue how to do it. Right. So um, that's tremendous IP for Claris, yep. diminishing the value of experts that are like us in this room. Yep, well, our meaning we better find another way to be relevant, right? <laughs> because they've, they've, they've gone to the cloud. I mean, you look at everything they're doing, they're eliminating, honestly, tedious things at this point for us. Right. But they're, you know, it's logical. They're develop on cloud. You know, they're 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 basically author on web. I think is is the buzzwords they're using, right? That they're working for a next gen, is uh, is a perfect example of that, right? I want my my user who doesn't even have an executable on their desktop. They're working. They're interacting via web browser to be able to create a new layout or change a layout. Like, like WordPress. Move objects. You you've got all the WordPress things, I mean, you still need a developer if you want it to be a good website, but you, you bring in all the different plugins 
um, that are free, some are paid. You know, they're creating a marketplace opportunity for sure. Yeah, and I think that's part of their answer is the marketplace. Which that goes back goes to what to yeah, what Heather was saying. Heather was saying. Um, and it, like the Alti Pro example, mm -hmm. is it, they have said they're 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 on record not not saying this is how we're going to do it, but as having said, our intention is that Connect has a marketplace similar to what they're trying to do with FileMaker Marketplace, mm -hmm. where if you build a connector that's in some either super complicated thing or super esoteric thing or whatever, okay, hey, it only has a target market of a thousand people, but those thousand people might be willing to pay a thousand dollars because it solves so many problems or saves so much time, which then becomes a different uh, revenue source for those of us with the IP who would invest in it. I want us to figure out what that product is. <laughs> <laughs> The, the million dollar, the thousand million people dollar times one. a thousand yes. dollars, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, mean, I think along the, the non-FileMaker speakers route, I think it'd be interesting to, you know, hear something from Matt or, or Jeff or, or Anthony on, you know, someone who isn't a FileMaker developer, but who has to talk to and play with FileMaker on a daily basis of, hey, here are all the hoops we had to jump through before connect in order to do this thing and now connect makes our job easier so not you know not even from a filemaker side but from a we were having to write custom php apis and and all this creative stuff to do this thing and well now we can just set that up with connect in 10 minutes and um you know that i think that story could be interesting or Eric, how about just someone who has to communicate with FileMaker developers on a daily basis? <laughs> the, 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 the Google Translate? Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're, we're, we're kind of at our time. Um, this has been fantastic. Thank you all for attending. And as usual, we have our lunch. So if you're watching this online now or later, second Friday in Dallas, come join us every month uh, in person and we'll feed you. So uh, yeah, uh, let me just real quick uh, before we end here, we do have, as described, next month is gonna be Meet Claris Connect and I honestly don't have the specifics yet, but uh, this will be more than just us doing this. I think we'll have a press kit, we'll probably have uh, login that we can use uh, and use the actual active product and so forth, right? So uh, meet Claris Connect will be exciting. And then uh, Lucky Friday the 13th, uh, we had another one of those recently. So it's the second Somewhere. one recently um, is going to be our favorite tricks. Uh, and, and, and I'm hoping, I'm working hard to make sure that we don't just limit this to uh, our favorite FileMaker tricks. I'd love this to be our favorite Claris Connect tricks, our favorite PHP tricks, our favorite Python tricks, our favorite mind tricks. I, you know, <laughs> I, I want to cast a wide net there. So hopefully we can have some fun with that one. And I would love uh, for some community participation in that as well. So with that, thanks all. Um, Happy New Year and have a great 2020.